Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Lord had already laid this passage on my heart uh, when uh, the information was again presented that this was the first uh, passage that my father preached from on the first service uh, of this church. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's also a passage uh, that uh, we have uh, kind of grown fond of and uh, rather claimed uh, for uh, our church. It's written up here on the wall, uh, the idea of the victory that uh, we receive uh, through Christ Jesus. You saw that PowerPoint that ended with that scripture and uh, the reminder of the crosses and, the, and just the reflection upon all that God has done uh, for us uh, in our lives. Uh, uh, I'm not sure of uh, how all the, uh, the events of the day, how they're stirring your emotions, uh, but mine are certainly stirred. And uh, the reality is this, I miss my dad. And uh, there are times I wish he was still here. I, I think now that I've learned a few things, we could make a pretty good team. Now I'm not sure how uh, it would be on his end. Uh, uh, I... Uh, if you're ever wondering why he moved to Texas, it wasn't because of any of you. It was because of me, all right? Uh, he didn't like the way I preached. That's what he told me. Uh, I'm not joking, all right? I'm serious. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I irritated him in so many ways. When he talked about being tedious, that was me, okay? He called me uh, tedious very, very often. Uh, but uh, the reality is, is I know that he loved me. And uh, I loved him, and uh, he, he was all about making me into a man. And uh, he went about it a different way sometimes that I don't know that I always agreed with, uh, but uh, he, he really wanted me to be able to stand on my two feet. And I trust that in many ways of the scriptures that encourage us to honor our parents that I have done that and continue uh, to honor uh, him. Now, had he not been as honored as he was, we probably would have made an even better team, all right? So I've confessed my sin, I've confessed his sin, and uh, the reality is this, though, he's in heaven with the Lord, and we're still here. And uh, though some of us may desire to be there uh, now, the reality is that we must face that God has given to us the ability and the opportunity to continue to serve him here uh, on this earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see verse 57 and verse 58. And I'll just go ahead and read uh, both of these verses. And then we'll, 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 we'll kind of focus on the first one, 57, uh, this morning. And then uh, in the afternoon session, we'll actually focus a little more on verse 58. But let's, uh, let's just read together, actually, both of these scriptures here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57 and verse 58. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the day that you've given to us. We thank you now for the time that we can have to... Uh, open your word and to learn from it, Lord. And I thank you for the opportunity you've given to me to be able to preach uh, the messages that you've placed upon my heart. And Father, I know that I'm inadequate to do so, that my abilities lack. But Father, I'm grateful that I am in the service of you with the power that you possess that is promised to be able to utilize my life this morning. And so, Lord, I submit myself to being that vessel in your hands that, Lord, you would just minister to each and every one of our hearts today in helping us to, to know the message, to know the lessons, to know the, the principles that you have instructed uh, or instructions for us. And, Lord, that we would take them then and apply them to our life and that, Father, in somehow, some way that this church would be benefited from it and that you would be able to move us onward and and strengthen our resolve to be able to carry out those things that you have designed for us to carry out while we're still here on this earth. Lord, we thank you for the past. We thank you so much for each and every person that has been through these doors. We thank you for those that have ministered and those that have given. And Father, those that have sacrificed and those that have learned and those that have, have served and 
and, and for your cause and for your sake. And, and Lord, bless and, and guide us as we, as we continue to build upon that foundation that you have already uh, begun. And Father, I'm so grateful for those that are still here and those that have been here for many, many, many years. And Lord, those that you have uh, brought here even in the recent uh, times. And Father, we're just grateful that, that you uh, uh, have allowed us to continue to be uh, a church. And we pray that you would help us now as we uh, just take time uh, to focus on those things, Lord, and to hear from you this morning. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, the very first word of this scripture is what? But. That gives us the very first point of this scripture, or of this message. And that is this, a hopeless condition. A hopeless condition. The whole idea here of the word but is to uh, join it to some of the other thoughts that have been presented, not only throughout this book, but specifically throughout uh, this chapter. And when we consider the idea that God has butted into our lives, so to speak, we consider that there was a need for God to do so. We consider this idea this morning that each and every one of us, if we're going to be honest with God, we, we, we have a, a part of us, a hopeless condition that we have experienced. And the reality is this, is that really... Uh, in regards to maybe not necessarily so much of the hopelessness, but in the inadequate aspect of our lives, we still experience that today. I want you to go back in this chapter a little bit to verse 12. Verse 12, and we'll pick just a few scriptures throughout this chapter to help emphasize these uh, aspects or these points of this message. In verse 12, the Bible says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? When we see the, 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 uh, the time of Jesus Christ and the ministry that he uh, lived and that he uh, 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 served in, we see that there was a group uh, specifically uh, called the Sadducees that did not believe in the resurrection. But as is such the case in so many uh, uh, situations that even today we look at, some of those philosophies or some of those uh, errors of thinking can kind of find themselves uh, into uh, a, a situation where the truth is being preached and the truth is being taught. And they'll hold on to some of those uh, doctrinal errors. And I think Paul is trying to help this church here in Corinth to make sure that they understand that that particular thinking was incorrect. Aren't you glad today that we can preach the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ? I mean, if we did not have the resurrection, notice what the rest of these scriptures say. Very first 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So we go from the standpoint of, you know, the, the fact is this, you, you, you're born, you live, you die, and that's the end. But that's not correct, is it? You're born, you live, you die, and then after that, eternity. And uh, that's what Paul is emphasizing in these scriptures. And he's saying, if you say that there's no resurrection of those that die, then the reality is this, you must say that Christ is not risen. In verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So if we have an issue this morning, the fact that the resurrection is not really uh, a truth, it didn't really occur, then all the things that we've ever stated, all the things we've ever preached according to the Word of God is simply vanity. It's useless. It means absolutely nothing. And the faith that we constantly talk about needing to be exercised, not only in salvation, but in Christian living, that is also empty. That means absolutely nothing. You know what that sounds like to me? A hopeless condition. And he says here also in verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. In other words, we're, we're liars. We're not even telling the truth. We're not speaking the truth. We're not giving you the, the, the truth. Therefore, we are false witnesses and we should just be cast aside. We should be tried. Because why? We have testified of God that He raised up Christ, 
whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Now, understand Paul's not saying this morning that Christ did not rise, right? We are, we're all understanding of that. He's just saying that if you say that, here's the things that you need to consider. Here's the things that you need to uh, understand. In verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. You see, now that's a, that's a hopeless condition uh, to be in. And verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So anyone that has died claiming salvation in Jesus Christ, you know what? They just cease to exist. They're, they're, they're gone. And in verse 19, I think he really sums it up for us. He says, in, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Whew. Anybody want to be in that kind of situation? <laughs> Most miserable. Now here's the hopeless condition and, and, and we need to understand uh, obviously that, that Christ is risen. We, we, we preach that, we teach that. I'll never, I'll never not preach or teach that because I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and uh, I look forward to the day that I'll be able to see him. But can you place yourself in that kind of scenario where you don't believe those things? Could you place yourself in that kind of scenario and think about it in this way? When you were without Christ, without hope, you were in a hopeless condition. And he talks about that idea of being in our sins. And the reality is this, is there's many people in this world today that are in a hopeless condition. The, 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 the fact of the scriptures and some of the things that they describe in regards to a lost individual or somebody without the knowledge and understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are in a hopeless condition. But here's the thing, I started to think a little bit more about this and, and going kind of from the standpoint, okay, I, I do believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I, I, I am saved this morning, and uh, yet there's still times in my life that I seem like I end up in defeat. I end up in a, a hopeless uh, scenario, scenario. And I thought about it in these sense. Your everyday occurrences, there's times of trouble and problems. Uh, a lot of times, yes, these are caused by your own actions, but other times they're caused by the actions of others. Sometimes they, they show up in the idea of financial issues or family con conflicts or uh, material loss. Anybody experience a little win this week? Yeah. Man, I don't know if anybody lost anything, uh, um, but I did see a lot of things all over the place, right? And, and uh, we had to do our fair share uh, of picking up uh, uh, stuff because of all that wind. But there's times of emotional down. There's times when we experience in our life that joy simply seems to be a very elusive uh, trait, something that is just not able to be experienced. Sometimes negativity is ruling in our hearts and ruling in our life and, and emotionally we're just down in the depths. There's times of difficult circumstances, uh, those bad things that happen that are beyond our control or uh, times when we're dealt with life that, that becomes less than enjoyable. I, everybody understands what I'm talking about here this morning, right? I mean, these are things that we experience on every day and, and times when we feel defeat and times when, when, when it just seems like there's just no reason to continue moving onward. Times of lost hope when I can't see beyond uh, right now. I can't see to, to uh, tomorrow when everything looks dim and everything looks dark. The times of sin, the times when I'm out of fellowship with God, the times when I feel like God's not speaking or I'm not listening, the times when, when I'm in disobedience or times when I've broken that communication with the Lord, times when I'm not in the Word of God, and times when I'm not uh, receiving the instruction from God, the, those hopeless moments, those conditions of being in those scenarios. If you think about it, it's simply stated this way. You know, we must acknowledge our inability, our insufficiency, and our inadequacy. Because we just simply many times can't or we're not or we fail look at verse 8 this is the apostle paul talking about himself here 
He said, last of all, he was seen to me also as one, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, you know the story of Paul. You know his life. Uh, um, we've got quite a, quite a few descriptions of, of how he lived prior to Jesus Christ. Yes, he was a good guy. Yes, he was well-learned. More than likely, he was probably even wealthy. But he took it upon himself to be a representative of the false religion and try to annihilate Christianity, try to erase the memory of Christ, try to eliminate those that had claimed Christ. And Paul knew that. And you follow some of the other teachings of, of Paul in regards to what he felt about himself. And I know that, that we tend to look at Paul and we see all the accomplishments, we see all the, the souls that he was uh, personally instrumental in bringing to Christ. We see the places he traveled to. We see the, 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 the difficulties that he put up with in order to be able to carry the gospel uh, where he carried, the, the sacrifices that he made. And, and we hail Paul as, as that great missionary or that great evangelist or the great pastor. We, we hail him as one that did so much for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet Paul himself realized, listen, it's not me. It's not who I am. It's not what I can do. And when we get to a verse like this one in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, you know, I don't think the rest of that verse really means a lot until we understand that first word, the word but. But... Once we do understand it, we can move into point number two. You ready for that? You know the reality is, is the time says that I should be done. But I'm just getting started. Number two, a happy communication. A happy communication. You wake this morning, say amen. A happy communication. When you consider... This next phrase, it says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And I believe that the level of thanks that I offer to God is in direct cor correlation to how I feel about myself or how I see myself prior to God, or without God, or without the help and the power and the strength of God. You, you understand what I mean in that? When are you really grateful for something? When it meets a need. When it provides you with something that you did not have before. When it enables you to be able to accomplish something that you could not accomplish before. Now whatever that thing is or whatever that gift is provided to you, uh, whatever it helps you in, your level of thanks is, is really a uh, proportion to how it was before you had that thing. Now, sometimes we get things and it doesn't really do anything for us. It doesn't change our life any or it doesn't uh, meet any kinds of needs. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, thank you for that. And then other times it's like, man, I use that every day of my life. Thank you so much for giving that to me. And wow, our level of thanks is just kind of through the roof. And I think it's the same way with the Lord today. Some of us are not thankful to God because we don't really, really think too much about what it was without God. If there's any disadvantages to growing up in church, that's probably kind of uh, one of those is you, you grow up with it, you get familiar with it, and it's always there, and you never, you never really experience a whole lot of life without it. Now, I think there's a lot of other advantages, and I'm praised the Lord that I was raised in church and, and raised by godly parents and taught these things. 
But you know, it's hard for me. Sometimes I can't just take that for granted. I can't just say, oh yeah, thank you, God, or thanks be to God. That's a good thing. But rather, there should be something inside that really expresses that, uh, that, that heart of thanks to the Lord. I thought of it in a, in, in a few, few different ways. First of all, an emotion of the heart, an emotion of the heart. And I know that we, are, we stray away a lot of times from the word emotion uh, because of the difficulties that our emotion brings into life. Sometimes I, I feel happy, sometimes I feel sad, and, and, and the reality is I'm to rejoice all the time. So emotions can be tricky, right? But the, here's the thing. God created emotions, and emotions, when they're in the right uh, a sequence of order, are a wonderful addition to our life. And giving thanks is one of those additions. When you have a, a heart of emotion towards God and you're lifting up your heart in praise and adoration of who God is and you're thanking Him for being God, listen, there's a whole lot more to uh, that opportunity of giving thanks. So don't be afraid uh, of that emotion that can accompany giving thanks. Then there's also that expression of the heart, the expression of my gratitude for God uh, uh, to God for the benefit that He provides to my life. I, I like this idea, but thanks be to God, I, especially when you consider this uh, totality of this particular chapter and, and some of the other things we'll look at here in just a minute. But, but the Apostle Paul, by the time he gets to this, it's like, okay, I brought you all the way down to here, but let me elevate you back up. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Let's express that thanks to God. And you know, you and I ought to take time and we ought to be expressing that thanks to God all the time. There shouldn't be a day go by that you don't express thanks to God. A thanks to God for something He did for you that day. Thanks to God for a, a part of His character that, that meant something to you that, that day. Thanks to God for who He is and for what He wants to do and, and for what He did and for what He's going to do. And, and, and thanks to be to God that, that He's just simply still there. Amen. 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 Come on, some of y'all are getting that glassed over look that I just I don't enjoy preaching to as much, all right? Listen, thanks be to a God. Thanks be uh, to God. Now here it is also, though, an evidence of the heart. An evidence of the heart. We, we have the emotion there. We express it. And there should be evidence there that I am thankful to God. Are you thankful to God today? Have you expressed that thanks? Is there emotion there that feels that, that, that you have these, that this, this desire of love towards God? And you appreciate what He's done in your life. If it's not there, then go back to the hopeless condition. Go back to where you were. Go back to what life is without Him. And then you'll be able to have a greater appreciation for Him. Uh, I think there's plenty of scripture that talks about this concept of rejoicing, this concept of giving thanks, this concept of praising. And here's the thing. I, I would encourage you in your life, listen. Every day, take an opportunity to give thanks to God for something. Every single day. Don't let it go. Don't let a day go by. And, and I think that, that once you find out what that's like, that then you'll probably try to add more than just one time a day. Uh, we can get into some of the scriptural patterns of three times a day. Three times a day, giving thanks to God. And if you have a hard time doing that, then... Then, then find a way to record it. Find a way to write it down. Giving thanks to God. And don't forget about that. You know, listen, giving thanks to God is not just a matter of honoring and praising God, which I know we're to do. But do you realize giving thanks to God is going to do something in your life and in my life? We talk about that relationship with God. Give thanks to Him, and your relationship will increase. Number three, the help to conquer. The help to conquer. So we have a hopeless condition, we have a happy communication, but we have the help to conquer. What does He say there in the next part of that verse? Which giveth us the victory. Which giveth us the victory. This is just an amazing word when you consider the idea of victory. I want you to look back to verse 20. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead. This is after he said in verse 19, We are all men most miserable. <laughs> if this was the case, he wasn't risen, this would be the, the, the scenario. But, in verse 20, 
But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For, verse 21, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall what? All be made alive. So yes, because of our father Adam, we die because of the sin nature that's been passed upon us. And now we've inherited that. Now we act in that. But because of Christ, all shall be made alive. Now, you think of all the different ways that we could describe victory. You think of all the different ways that we could uh, experience victory. But I don't know that there's any one way that is as uh, amazing as conquering death itself. That is victory. <laughs> He goes on. He says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, whom he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. He will conquer death itself. Skip down to verse 50. There's a lot of good scriptures in here, I know. But I don't have time to go through all of them. And some of them, actually, you actually have to really kind of study and think about because there's some interesting uh, ways things are worded. But verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. A mystery. You like mysteries? I like mysteries as long as I can know the end of it. That's why anytime I read a mystery, one of them books that claimed to be a mystery, I went to the last few pages and read first. Then I went back. Now some of you say that is a cardinal rule that you do not break. But, well, anyways, I, I'm a little tender-hearted sometimes, all right? And I don't like to get attached to people that are going to die. So I make sure who's going to be alive in the end. And I make sure I know what's going to kind of the turnout is going to be. That way, when I read the book, I, I can already eliminate whoever I don't want to be attached to within the book. And go, Okay, so there, I, all right, I digress for a moment. But back to this for 51. He's going to show us a mystery. I like mysteries when they're revealed. He said, we shall not all sleep. That doesn't mean in church service only. <laughs> but we shall all be changed. Changed! In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruption, uh, corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. Uh, one of the things uh, about the message my dad preached, I, some of you probably could pick up on it, he, he, was, he was not feeling well at all. I mean, it, it was just it was pretty amazing that he just really got through an hour of preaching there. He was not feeling well. You could kind of see it in his face and, and uh, notice a few things. And then, as I said, six months later, the Lord calls him home. But you know what? He's not living with those same health problems anymore. I thought about it as he was talking about going to the convenience store and holding me. I said, I was saying to myself, uh, Dad, you should have eaten less donuts and fed me less donuts too. You might still be preaching right now. <laughs> but we'll be changed. Corruption falls apart. 
creaks and cracks and hurts, well, I'll be gone. And the incorruptible body will be replaced. Folks, that's victory. <laughs> and that's what this passage helps us to understand. When you think about it in our life, there's victories over the devil. There's victories over our selfishness. There's victories over addictive sin. There's victories over feelings. There's victories over circumstances. There's victories over death, which we've mentioned from these scriptures. I found this. This is from a fellow named Watchman Nee. He was a Chinese Christian author and church leader during the early 20th century. He spent the last 20 years of his life in prison and was severely persecuted by the communists in China. Here's what he said. Any, any victory that does not more than conquer is just an imitation victory. While we're suppressing and wrestling, we're only imitating victory. If Christ lives in us, we will rejoice in everything. We will thank and praise the Lord. We will say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord forever. Now for a guy to experience what he experienced to be able to say those things is pretty amazing. I call that victory. <laughs> but let me give you one more point this morning, and that's this. The honor of our captain. The honor of our captain. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. And read that last phrase with me. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one way that this victory comes. And that's through Jesus. There's only one way we experience victory here on this earth. And that's through Jesus. Oh, we might be able to win the ball game. Or we might be able to win uh, uh, some board game. We might be able to have those victories that we, we, we try to claim sometimes when we turn over the new leaf. But the reality is this, is the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that provides true victory in your life and in my life. Look at back, at back at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep, some have already died. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen to me also of one born out of due time. What is Paul referring to? He's referring to what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died, the fact that he was buried, and the fact today that what? He rose again. He rose again. Now we have victory. Now we're not hopeless any longer. Now, that, now we don't have to uh, die and pay for our own sin in eternity called hell. Now that we don't have to live in defeat uh, uh, regards to our lust and our flesh and, and even in defeat to the world or in defeat uh, of the devil and his purposes that he might have for your life. We don't have to live that any longer because victory has been promised. Victory has been offered, but it only comes through Jesus Christ. If we could, we could raise up arms, we could all go buy guns, we could get lots of ammunition, and, and even if we could put all of our resources together and buy a tank, we are not going to get victory. The victory, the Bible says, isn't based in this warfare that is not with flesh and blood. But... Our weapons are mighty. They're mighty. Because why? They come through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen, are, are you experiencing that kind of victory? Outside of Christ, I'm only a sinner. 
but in Christ, I'm saved. Outside of Christ, I'm empty. In Christ, I'm full. Outside of Christ, I'm weak. In Christ, I am strong. Outside of Christ, I cannot. In Christ, I am more than able. Outside of Christ, I have been defeated. In Christ, I'm already victorious. The question is, how meaningful are the words? In Christ. The message this morning is the idea for you and I to claim the victory. It's a claim. The victory. We can be blunt today, can't we? I know we say we can be honest, but we are hopefully always honest. (laughs) You ever look around and get discouraged? I mean... I don't know how you are with reading the news. I go back and forth from wanting to just put my head in the sand and pretend it's not there to wanting to be well informed to not wanting all the negative information. But anybody else getting tired of murder? Killing? Anybody else getting tired of Immoral sin? Anybody else getting discouraged by just the overall, I don't even know what to say, spirit of the world that we live in today? My dad used to tell me often, he said, son, I do not envy you one bit. Because once I'm off the scene, you're going to be still pastoring. And I don't know how you're going to pastor in the world that you're going to face. He knew how. It's only through our Lord Jesus Christ. But he recognized the reality. Anybody get tired of what seems like people just ignore the truths of the Word of God? whether it's the gospel or the fact of right living. (coughs) Anybody ever get tired of disharmony, a lack of unity, fighting, get tired of broken relationships? Is anybody else, you know, just kind of start to feel like this book and the truths within it that we're trying to live and we're trying to be, it's almost like, what's the sense? Anybody ever think about if I didn't have, a, if I had a choice in the matter, I wouldn't even go to church. I wouldn't preach, teach, And by tempted just to kind of slide out, walk away, do your own thing. And by any anybody else, look at the. Oh man, here we go again. We're talk about the anniversary service. Talk about what we're going to do as a church. But look, what have we done? We're still in the same building after, I can't count that high, 30 years. We've got less people now than we had 10 years ago. Anybody else ready to just take off the jacket? Throw the towel in.
Thank you for holding my coat. Reality, right? We've all been there. Some of us are there. But that's why we go to the scriptures. That's why we read 1 Corinthians 15, 57. I don't have all the answers. But I know this. I can live the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have all the answers. But I know this. The worse it gets, the greater his power and strength seems to be. I don't have all the answers. I don't always know how to get up in the morning and keep going. I don't always know how to get to the next message and preach it again. I don't always know how to go find the next lost person that's probably going to blow me off or probably not going to listen or probably be so confused that it's going to take hours and hours and hours to share with them Jesus Christ. I don't know how to do that except to realize I can't, but He can. And if there's any going from the past to the present to the future, it's going to be by our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, we have God's promises of provision and continuous protection. His constant care and guidance in the right direction. True mercy that endures forever, along with compassion and love that fails us never. He promises strength when we are weak and comfort for all those who weep. Blessed by Him for many reasons, these promises benefit us in every season. The Lord gives grace in trials and peace for all of life's many miles. His Father-like traits are truly a benefit, bringing great gifts when our lives depict it. Abundant life is what He came to give, which is opposite of the thief who wishes us not to live. What he says, we will do. Even when we let him down and disobey him too. It is difficult to describe the promises of my God who gave it all. That we may become his child and answer his call. Child of God, trust him today. Look for his return that at your feet, his feet, your crown, you may lay. Praise God for His promise of everlasting life which He will fulfill along with a new body and home where we will always accomplish His will. This morning will you claim the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come before